Welcome to SSI Security Speaking Podcast, brought to you by Security Sales and Integration. Each episode features thought leaders from throughout the professional security channel discussing technology, winning business practices, hot industry trends, and emerging opportunities. We appreciate your interest and encourage you to subscribe to Security Sales and Integration and its newsletters. Regularly visit securitysales.com for the latest news and follow SSI on social media. Thank you. Could you tell us how the uh, the business is structured in terms of the branding? You know, the, the the Brinks name has got such a rich history and so well known to consumers and highly regarded. Monotronics is also long to dealers as a brand name and also highly regarded. So, you know, how does that separate and what are the advantages to each? Yeah. Uh, great question. We are all very, very uh, proud and uh, happy to have our Brinks Home Security name. And uh, it was a name that we had the pleasure of acquiring in 2018. And we have actually been operating our core residential security business as Brinks Home um, for the past few years. So it's still relatively new to us, but um, it's also still relatively new to you know partners who are learning us as Brinks Home instead of Monotronics. Um, and customers, it takes time to kind of adopt that name. Um, so we, we are very grateful to have it. We know that Brinks is a world-class brand. And um, there's a lot of, uh, when you ask customers in the market, if they recognize you know, Brinks as a home security business, there is high aided awareness. And um, so we know that we get the benefit of that and our partners get the benefit of that. And um, so really for us, what we're focused on is defining what that name means. And that's something that we're really, um, we are kind of prioritizing this year as something that we're building upon. And really we have key initiatives across the entire business that are going to further define that name. Um, but that's the name that we are moving forward with from here on out. Our, we still have our beloved Monotronics name and potentially could be something that we reserve uh, for other uses in the future, but today, um, Rob Brings Home Name is, is our core name. Mm-hmm. Do, do you get a lot of questions uh, about that, especially from, you know, the dealer channel? Actually, our dealers really have embraced the Brings Name, and they love, uh, and Wade, actually, you may want to chime in here as well. Um, they love having that name. I think when our dealers, especially, are going out into the community and talking about our business, Customers immediately know that Brinks name. They may not necessarily know that um, Brinks was associated with home security, but it actually makes it a really intro, easy introduction for them to um, talk to customers um, in the space. Wade, is there anything you want to add to that? You're absolutely right, Crystal. I mean, I think the Brinks name helps their sales reps get in the door and they appreciate that. I could definitely see that. I mean, when I came into the industry uh, 20 years ago, ever since then, I mean, Brinks was always just one of the uh, strongest names and uh, had a reputation behind it of, of excellence and reliability and all that. So, yeah, and, and I'm just going to jump in on that one, Scott. The, we have a lot of folks that actually work for us that were with the original Brinks uh, before it was spun out. And um, they come with that core conviction of customer service excellence and really building that relationship with the customer around the brand. And I just also say Crystal's done a terrific job. We're building a brand strategy that is focused. And Crystal, you cut me off. I go too far because we're we're launching our brand strategy pretty soon um, around the customer. And it really is about, you know, living life without worry. It's a premium experience. And this is core to the business model, Scott. You know, everything that Wade's doing is driven by this philosophy. The old dealer model of kind of, you know, you've got a dealer who operates under their own name, they go to market in a particular way. That is not the model that we're adopting. Our model really is around a brand. And in our go to market, it's an omni channel. We're going to use that brand consistently, whether it's our dealers, our field sales, our inside sales, our authorized reps, our partners. They will all operate with the same sense of excellence and focus on the customer. That is core to what we're doing. And I think that resonates with this brand. Crystal, I, I'll get off my soapbox and back to you. <laughs> Niles is our biggest brand ambassador. I love to take credit, but I think he still remains number one. So. No, Scott, I, I tell you, I do, I'm a strong believer in brand. Um, I was 
with the parent company that acquired Monotronics 10 years ago. I believe that they needed a stronger brand. And I'm actually the one that negotiated the deal with Brinks for the license to use the brand. I believe in it 100%. I think there's enormous, enormous untapped potential in the marketplace for us to leverage this. And we're really in, I would say, inning number one of that process. So super excited about what we're doing with the brand and how that impacts all aspects of the business. So when you look at the aspects of the business, um, you know, in terms of the, the, the sales, installation, service, monitoring, um, to the end user, how is it set up and, and um, you know, how is it set up with the, the dealers that become part of that? I mean, Wade, I'll let you should, um, you should touch on with the dealers, but again, our, our organization right now, really, we are driving a brand philosophy. It's not just presenting to the customers, it's how we present to our own employees. And it's changing the culture of how we operate, whether it's in the call center, the monitoring center, field service, even product. It is all driven off of a brand strategy of customer centricity, service, and excellence. And, and Wade, that's something I think has resonated really strongly with our partners in the dealer channel as we make this transition. So I'll, I'll punt that to you. Absolutely. I think what, what we know is that we want our dealers who are employing the sales reps that are our first point of contact with a customer, we wanna make sure that they put Brinks in the best possible light and they give that customer a world-class experience. And we know to do that, we need to give the dealers a world-class experience. We need to treat them like true partners. And we work, we work really hard uh, in, in the last year uh, to make sure that we're, that we're uh, true to that. And we've, we've seen some pretty great results. Yeah, and Scott, I'm just, uh, the other piece of this, how it really, threads through the organization. I'm going to actually pivot to men. You know, even our product and product strategy is going to be driven by the brand promise. This company historically really didn't have a true product roadmap. It was kind of, well, what's the latest and greatest? What's being offered in the marketplace? Our dealers sell it and we put it on station and monitor it. That is not the way we're rolling forward. That's why uh, we brought on men from Samsung. It is how do we define that customer experience looking out 6, 12, 36, 60 months into the future. I think there are a lot of great opportunities out there and we are actively participating in this discussion, you know, with manufacturers, with, you know, the service platforms. And um, so, yeah, I think there, there will be a great, you know, opportunities, growth opportunities for, for all of us. And, and we are very, you know, excited about, you know, creating the new value, new use cases for our um, consumers. And how do you see the uh, rising Internet of Things, you know, kind of playing into that? Yeah. So, you know, with with Internet of Things, like how, how we can actually connect, you know, the security and protection, you know, in the context of the Internet of Things, um, like, like smart cities, like, you know, uh, smart grid system. It, it's all very relevant use cases, like connected orders, right? So I think, you know, how we can actually create, you know, the use cases with all these like relevant uh, technologies developed by the IoT players. And again, like, can we actually design seamless experience, right? So these are all different sort of somewhat like segregated like use cases, how we can actually, you know, create the connection and make sure that experience is not really fragmented. So I think those are the things that, that we are focusing on today. As far as uh, DIY in that market, uh, does that have a place uh, within the uh, Brinks slash Monotronics organization now in terms of selling and or monitoring? And how do you view that market? So, you know, these like self-monitoring market, um, I think it definitely provides some challenges, but at the same time, the growth opportunities for us. I think, you know, in overall, this like, uh, hardware oriented, like self monitoring devices and services, you know, rather than they actually cannibalize, you know, the market that we are focusing on today, they actually expand the overall security, uh, you know, market. So they actually untap those people who never, you know, thought about like uh, actually buying a security solutions for themselves. So I think, you know, these like, you know, DIY oriented services uh, definitely increase the awareness of the entire category. 
and really, uh, you know, help us to kind of like, you know, finding those opportunities. So um, I think, you know, also another thing is, you know, customer needs are always changing, you know, as they move through their life stage, right? So I think, you know, these like uh, self-monitoring uh, oriented like devices can be an entry point. And once they actually move on to the next stage of their life, like, you know, having kids or, you know, and, you know, buying a new house or kind of like, you know, having, you know, someone in their, their family that to, you know, that they need to actually take care of, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, monitor uh, from remote places. I think, you know, they will definitely be more open to our solutions, which, which is more comprehensive um, solutions to, you know, um, address those needs. So, I think, you know, definitely, you know, the, uh, you know, the industry um, has been growing with this momentum. And I, I think, you know, we definitely, you know, have an opportunity to basically kind of like offer our value proposition to these customers when it's more relevant, um, you know, uh, to, to them. So I think, you know, it, it definitely creates some, um, some challenges, but long term, I think that that is a great growth opportunity for us. All right. Thank you. Last question for you. Um, the um, false alarm issue. Mm -hmm. uh, what kinds of technologies uh, does the company deploy and, and what kind of practices to, you know, minimize or um, the dream would be eliminate, but, uh, you know, <laughs> what, what tactics does the company yeah. take? So uh, we are very glad to say that, you know, we are launching this like cancel and verify feature in, in the app. So, Consumer now has much more faster and seamless way to actually verify and cancel, you know, the alarm. So I think that's definitely going to help us to, you know, reduce the false alarm. And again, the camera speakers, these devices capture much more and richer, uh, you know, data. So I think leveraging these like technologies and really redesigning the scoring system, alarm scoring system, will definitely, you know, get us into that place where we can significantly reduce our false alarm. So, yep, I think, you know, we are in discussion with, you know, the platform companies, uh, you know, how we can actually, you know, create much more efficient and more accurate, you know, scoring system and, uh, you know, alarm responding uh, process and protocol. Um, so, yeah, I think you know, there, are, there are great opportunities. And, you can, you know, like reducing the false alarm also meaning that, you know, you have much more accurate and faster system because now you don't have to, you know, uh, the, the responders can focus on, uh, you know, much, much accurate information, um, which means when consumer actually needs uh, to, to get that dispatch services, they can get much more, uh, you know, they can be reached, reached, you know, much faster way to these like, you know, services when they really need it. So I think, you know, innovating, you know, in this like full salam, you know, reduction processes definitely means, you know, the improvement of the quality of the services, like speed of the services. So that's why we are heavily focusing on how we can actually improve and innovate there. Um, and does Brinks offer a video verification? So yes, we do provide video uh, verification services to the end users, um, but for even we do want to more. So I think, you know, starting, uh, you know, uh, later this year, we actually uh, launching a service, which is basically, uh, you know, the operators in our alarm monitoring center have a, you know, temporary access to the consumer's, uh, you know, video footage and video streaming. Only after, you know, consumer actually approves things, right? So, you know, with that opt-in, um, uh, with that opt-in, you know, when something goes off, you know, these like, you know, uh, operators in the monitoring center actually, you know, will be able to see uh, what's happening in the house. So they can actually, you know, verify things on behalf of the customers when they are, you know, not, not at home. So I think, you know, not just like giving, you know, the video analytics and video verification services to the end users, we actually expand that, uh, you know, technology, access to the technology to our entire operating system 
so we can, you know, again, you know, be more respond, uh, fast uh, responding, you know, whenever uh, consumers, you know, need our services. Uh, during the uh, the pandemic, did the company have to uh, have some remote uh, workers, and how did technology help facilitate that? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, definitely. Um, so you know, like during the pandemic, you know, people definitely spend more time at their home. So I think you know, in terms of like you know, protection uh, functionality or you know, smart home functionalities. Now, you know, you, you have like, you know, like video analytics services. So you can actually like, you know, um, manage like things like, you know, uh, and, and manage like multitasking like, you know, from home. So like, let's say you are now working, you know, remotely, you know, from home and how we can actually, you know, improve your sort of like connectivity issues. So, you know, we, we actually like, you know, rather than just like the protection services, you know, how we can actually improve the overall quality of the, uh, uh, you know, overall quality of the, the connectivity and, and you know, uh, internet speed. So let's say, you know, we are, we are providing some, you know, the, the Wi-Fi gating solutions and, uh, you know, the connectivity solutions to the consumers, you know, with the mesh products and things like that. So I think, you know, uh, it, it's not our core part of the business, like helping, you know, these like remote workers, you know, being more productive and more connected to the system. But we definitely, you know, uh, you know, address those issues because not, now people have, again, like more cameras, more connected devices at home. So we can actually, you know, uh, provide a solution so that they're, uh, you know, they, they actually continue um, you know, being connected, you know, at, at a very like, um, you know, stable, um, you know, level of like services. So yeah, we do provide those like, you know, uh, you know, hardwares and, and services to the consumer so that um, they can be, you know, they can be on the reliable like network for their work and um, family. What, what about internally though? I'm not sure if that's your role, but internally, as far as uh, Brinks personnel, uh, monitoring personnel, maybe having to monitor offsite during the pandemic or things like that. How, how was technology uh, enabler or have to uh, be leveraged to allow the, those kinds of things to take place internally during the pandemic? Yeah, I think, you know, probably I will check with our IT team and, you know, HL team, but, you know, like, you're right. I mean, you know, we definitely need to be 24-7, you know, to, you know, uh, provide, you know, the monitoring services. So, you know, we definitely have, you know, uh, our network solutions, you know, much more um, reliable and redundant as well in case that, you know, uh, to reduce the risk of loss. So, yeah, I think, you know, we, we definitely, you know, put a lot of like efforts to make sure we have redundant, uh, you know, uh, you know, connectivity and communication channels um, and, you know, reliable channels so that, you know, we can definitely provide, uh, you know, uh, seamless like uh, connectivities to our employees so that they can provide 24 seven stable and reliable like services our, um, to our customers. And, and Scott, if you want to do a deep dive on that, um, Jason Chancellor is our head of IT and Jayatri runs our customer service and monitoring center. And we did, you know, it's almost a year ago now, we did, you know, we have about 1400 employees in the company. We have about 1100 here in Farmers Branch in Dallas. And we, we literally relocated almost all of our employees out of this building. It was a massive undertaking to do that. And we did it without any disruption in service, monitoring, our MPS has actually gone up. It really, it's really, I would say, a triumph that this company, um, I think a lot of other companies did it as well, but we made that transition and it's been an interesting one. A lot of our employees like working from home. Some want to come back, um, safety first, but um, it, is, it has worked out very well. We still have our core uh, knock, the, the alarm center response center is still in this building and we keep that, that as staffed. We have our backup center is still ready to go, but we also have redundant monitoring if we need it from home. Uh, which is, you know, that's something new, but we haven't had to use that. We're still core here in the building when it actually goes to the alarm response. But customer service field, all that, um, they have been working remotely. It's pretty, I, I don't think I've seen Crystal in eight or nine months. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, 
our team, and like Niall said, our team did a fabulous job of mobilizing. Um, and very early on, I think our we were very proactive in saying, you know, early March, we, we see kind of this wave coming and we need to be ready. Um, so our, our IT team enabled the team very, very quickly and efficiently. And um, most of us are still working remotely. We have, you know, people who are in the office from time to time and our monitoring operations are still um, going in, but we have very uh, high safety protocol, temperature checks, um, pretty much best in class. Uh, our HR team is very proactive in making sure that we have testing available for folks who are coming into the building. Um, so overall, we are definitely safety first um, in our building and then also out in the field providing um, our partners and our sales reps who are in the field with all of anything they could possibly need to ensure that um, they're keeping themselves and our customers safe. And like, you know, over the pandemic, I mean, probably we really worried about the productivity of our workers. And, but I think, you know, like, you know, if I look back what we've achieved as our team in 2020, uh, I think it's tremendous. Like, Nine, more than 90% of the workers like, you know, working remotely, but with all these like technologies for, you know, collaboration, um, you know, tools, I, I think we've achieved a lot. And, and I think, you know, again, with the technology and then management trust in, you know, the workers, like, you know, and employees about, about, you know, their, you know, work act, you know, act, um, you know, uh, work like, you know, uh, commitment as well as you know um, ethnicity. So I, I think you know it, it's 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 definitely uh, amazing that you know we actually did it, uh, achieved that you know uh, with a lot of like support from the management team and IT and HL. So yeah, I think you know we are we are very proud uh, you know that we actually transitioned and settled um, in this like remote working environment without any um, you know uh, big disruption but actually like, you know, achieved a lot, you know, together. So they're very proud of it. Yeah, and Scott, I mean, I, I, I can tell from your questions, you're a tech guy. I mean, there's, there's clearly the technological part of this, but there's a cultural element as well, which is really important to us as an organization. As we disaggregated our employees from this building, we were deliberate about engaging with the employees, enhancing their benefits, doing things that would actually help them. And we, I mean, for instance, we created employee resource groups. We have six of them now. I think some of the people on this phone lead some of those groups. These are virtual groups. They're almost like clubs within the organization. And it's kind of creating a virtual community. Um, you know, my philosophy is um, this business will be successful if we are a family that takes care of its flock and the flock is our customers. And I got to take care of our employees. So we treat them like family. We take care of them. That's a deliberate and intentional, um, I don't say strategy, but it's what we do. And that, that has been a big part of the COVID response I think it's why we've been successful is people really do feel a sense of community to this organization. They want us to be successful and they care about what they're doing. I mean, this is, you know, if you're not into protecting people and actually improving people's life, this isn't the business to be in. That's one of the, I just, I love coming to work every day. I know we're helping people. And that's something that we push out throughout the organization. It's not just attrition and call wait time and unit economics. It's how do you improve someone's life? How do you make them feel secure, safe, and, and they can live their life <clears throat> without worry? That's, that's really what people are looking for in you know, home security. So that's, that's been a big part of the COVID response, not just the technical, but the cultural aspect as well. It's definitely an interesting time to sort of get acclimated in a new job or role uh, during what happened in 2020. Um, yep. There, there's what about, a, yeah. Go ahead, Scott. About what about in terms of how um, the pandemic has affected or changed uh, the sales process or the interaction with the uh, dealers and that sort of thing? How has that evolved yeah. and enabled? So, it, you know, it going back last year, first and foremost, we were concerned about the safety of our employees, our dealers' employees, um, and our customers. So it was how do you actually have you know, sales folks going into the home, interacting with people. Once we dealt with those issues and, and put the protocols in place, you know, candidly, people are spending more time at home. They are very receptive to home security. And we've seen a nice, I mean, Wade, you should jump in on the dealer network, but I, I think we've seen a nice rebound and how they're, they've adjusted to that. That's absolutely right. The second half of 2020 was a 
really strong uh, you know, half year for our, our dealers. I think it took a couple months to figure out how to adapt and uh, to COVID and then they've, they've gone gangbusters. And I can tell you as somebody who's still relatively new in the role, you know, one of the advantages of COVID uh, is that it has normalized talking to people via Zoom, talking to people via uh, you know, Teams and other apps. And you know, we have a nationwide dealer network that, you know, part of this role and as, as, as COVID rescinds, fingers crossed, uh, you know, I will get out on the road and travel more, uh, but it has made it totally normal for me to get, get on the phone, to see face-to-face um, our dealers across the country. And I feel like I've been able to develop, uh, I've been able to develop relationships with a broader uh, subset of our dealers than I would have otherwise. Um, and we, we brought on some great new dealers. We brought on eight new dealers since, uh, since January 1. Um, we're a growing network. And uh, one, of the, one of the big pieces of that network that, that we wanna work on is we, we wanna have a partner relationship with all of them. We want them to know us, like us, be in our family. And so uh, that's something that we've really managed to develop in the last year. What Wade has done in, in talking to that channel, the authorized partner, this is the old monotronics model. It really is partnering them with the brand and the product set as we go forward, where we actually harmonize the go-to-market. It's really important. That is a pretty massive change for this company. And it really was dealers kind of sold, well, I'm going to sell this panel or so that panel, I'll put it on ADC or SecureNet. We really are focused on harmonizing the customer experience, not only in our internal sales, but through Wade's channel and that, that channel. And that, that is a huge uh, transition. And it's been very welcome, I would say, by the dealers. So, but Wade, I'm sorry. You... That's, that's absolutely right, Niles. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a scale, right? It's a spectrum where authorized dealers is the traditional monotronics. Uh, and this is where, you know, they're doing the most uh, in terms of, you know, selling, marketing, installing, servicing the customer. Uh, and then this, where so you go down the funnel, you have authorized representative. Um, you know, this is, this is a sales team usually uh, that wants to focus on sales and marketing and leave the install servicing to us. Um, and, we, we partner with organizations who want to do that, with individuals who want to do that. And that program has been immensely popular. Um, we launched it um, last summer uh, in, in, in July, and the program has been growing rapidly since then. It's a really interesting opportunity for a lot of people, whether it's someone who um, has already been a dealer and would just prefer to focus on sales and marketing, someone who's getting into the industry and you know, isn't licensed in, you know, in all the states they want to uh, sell in or they don't have somebody who they can partner with to install the system, well, great. We, we have a brand. We have 20 years of expertise. We can be that partner. Um, and then the authorized partner program uh, where we're partnering with a you know, usually larger sales organization um, and they're going to focus on selling and marketing. They enter the order in our system. We'll go out. We'll uh, do the installation, service the customer, um, so we have a, we have a range of options that way we can accommodate, uh, you know, we can accommodate whatever the business is that wants to partner with us and let them focus on what they're best at while we focus on what we're best at. And you're only doing residential or you're also doing small business or larger business. What's the, uh, market breakdown? We, we also do small business. Um, so we, uh, you know, we're, principally uh, residential, but we also have a growing uh, small business presence as well. Maybe, and Scott, I'll just uh, jump in on that one. We, you know, we are definitely, our, our roots are in the, the home market. We do have a fair number of small business accounts and we did just complete an acquisition um, at the end of December uh, where there is a real um, terrific pool of, uh, I would call it commercial DNA. And so a commercial, especially in the small business side is something that we will we will pivot to and focus on going forward. Uh, now that we have a terrific team, that's the select security team that, that joined us in December and they are now part of our family. So really excited to have those guys on board. How, how big is uh, the company in terms of employees and, and offices and things like that? So our, our primary office is here in Dallas, about 1100 employees. We have offices in Kansas. We have offices in Pennsylvania. I think we still have a location in Chicago, but our core presence is here in, in the Lone Star State. So that's that's the primary. And uh, that may change. Um, we are rolling out field 
Uh, we have a field service, excuse me, field sales program that launched again less than a year ago. Uh, we're currently in Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Fort Worth, Dallas. And as we do that, we probably will begin building small points of present physical locations, which we typically haven't had in the past. I expect to see that expand over the next 36 months. So you probably see a larger footprint with our field sales. Um, as you know, we're already national. We're in every state, Puerto Rico, Canada. We have you know, almost a million customers. So this is, this is kind of a, a pivot in our business model, which is a little more uh, physical presence in the market. You uh, touched on it, I think, with some of the recent changes, but are there some other uh, technological uh, improvements uh, or just layout improvements or whatever, functional improvements to uh, your facilities and things like that that you'd like to highlight? I think Crystal is going to speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll let Crystal do it, but I, I would emphasize, um, well, Scott, I mean, just going back to Santa Monica. So before I got into this industry, I spent 20 years working in Santa Monica in the post-production industry. So you probably know all the post and tech. What we did in that industry is we built enterprise level platforms to ingest and manage content for the studios, commercial production. That philosophy of building platforms is what I brought into this company. So we are doing that today. And, and candidly, you sound like a, a tech guy. I would set you up with Dinesh. He is doing a terrific job building that platform. It informs us every single day, Scott. We meet as a team. We are now looking at the data. It is what is, what's the data set? What is it telling us every single day? That's the, that, that is literally a core philosophy in this organization. But Crystal, I'm going to pivot you to you. You touched on a big piece of it with the Enterprise Data Hub. That is really core to our being, and it's core to a lot of the programs that we're starting to spin up. And um, so as it relates to the technology side, that really is our main drive this year. I um, mean, is is really what's leading a lot of the decisions we make on key initiatives that we're launching and seeing through. And we do have a lot of initiatives that are aligned to our, our new brand strategy, which will be uh, public with next month. We're really, really excited about that. Um, but it really always is coming back to the data with every decision we're making. Do we have the data to support it? Can we learn from it? Can we test it? How do we improve? Um, so that, that really is central to everything. Um, one thing I will uh, tout that, you know, it's not necessarily, necessarily technology, but as it relates to improvements in the facilities, um, Kevin Lyons, who Niles mentioned, our uh, chief people officer, is actually undergoing a transformation of our main Dallas facility. And um, so when we are ready to welcome our partners, our people back into the building, um, it will feel like a new, um, very inspiring space. We already have a beautiful um, lot uh, in Dallas. We overlook a, a nice little lake um, and it's a really peaceful place to be. And so we're um, going through a transformation within our facility to, to really bring that beautiful outside inside as well. Um, so yeah, Chris, I, I mean, that is so perfect. I mean, Scott, really, this is a transformation story. The brand, the brand identity, the trade dress, the products, everything we're doing is transformational. It really is going from kind of the old model to, I would say, a more tech-focused, data-driven company, which, again, may sound cliche, but it's where the world's at today. And we're, we're doing it. So really, really excited about that. Well, from a logistics standpoint, we don't have to get into the technology because I know we don't have real techies on, on the call now, but um, the uh, changeover in communications from 3G, uh, is that a, a big issue or challenge for the business and, and how is that being navigated with the dealers? Uh, so let me just take it from the, the top side. We, we have um, probably about 300,000 3G customers and Bob Reedy. Uh, one of our terrific executives runs our field service. And so he has a program where we engage with marketing. We reach out to our customers and we have been in the process of converting them from 3G. Um, it is a massive undertaking. Um, I would say that it's gone really well. And I think part of it is the customer engagement. Um, and, and this is an opportunity. Like anytime, Scott, the 3G is a huge financial cost, right? Everybody's got to roll trucks. You got to change equipment. Um, but the truth is, it's an opportunity to, to connect with the customer. So I look at it as, okay, there's a cost, but let's connect to the customer. Let's improve their experience, maybe upgrade the equipment and give them something that they can say, oh, this is Brinks. We understand Brinks. So I don't know, Crystal, if you want to jump on that, but that's, 
Yeah, um, 3G is a huge campaign for us this year, and we do have multiple consumer touch points and um, really trying to reach customers where they are and how they want to interact with us. But um, to Niall's point, we're also using it as an opportunity to reground what the brand needs. There are some customers who may, you know, not have been as connected to us over the past few years, may even still think we are monotronics. Um, so we're really using this as a platform to engage those customers, make sure that they are happy with their products and services that they have in the home today, um, and just kind of reset the relationship. So we're, we're very excited about this project. Yeah. And then Scott, with the dealers, we, I mean, we acquire the accounts from the dealers, so we're 100% responsible. We, we do not require our dealers to go out and do that transition. That's, that's on our balance sheet, our nickel. We're happy to do it. So is that a cost that's absorbed or is there some charge to the, the customers? It's, we are not charging our customers to upgrade their systems. We are literally putting in either new systems, upgraded radios. And you know, Bob Reedy is the guy to have on this call because it really is, there's a lot of different things that we do because we have so many customers and we've acquired so many different customers from different channels. So it really depends on the panel uh, and the equipment, so. Yeah, that's right. We're segmenting that entire base to really understand, you know, the age of the customer, the product they have in the home, you know, what products and services they actually want. And um, so it's a very strategic um, engagement plan, just depending on who that customer is, where they came to us from and what product they have in the home today. Yeah. And with the uh, partner dealers, do you specify or provide uh, the products that they uh, install or how does that work? Wade, you want to take that? Is, the answer is it depends. Um, so well, I, mean, I think mean, the answer is in transformation. <laughs> yes, the answer is it depends, and the answer is also in transformation. So what we have been doing, uh, you know, if you start with our traditional dealer, uh, traditionally we ha had very little say into what products and services they offered. Um, and over time, what we've been doing is um, is constraining that somewhat so that our customers are able to have a more uniform experience. We want them to know what brand stands for. Um, at, at this point, our, our dealers um, install a handful of panels. Um, on the other hand, our authorized partners, so at the other end of the spectrum, the sales engines we're partnering with, those are actually selling a specific package uh, that we that we set um, with, with we specify the panel and the sensors and the uh, the add-ons, and then authorized rep. The other new channel is sort of halfway in between, uh, if that makes sense. Wade, what uh, what do you think uh, is an advantage for the the dealers to? Uh, I mean, what what's the primary incentive and advantage for for them at all those levels you talked about to to partner with with Brinks in your mind? It's a great question. I think there are there, there are several key advantages. One of them is you have a world class brand that's going to get you and your sales reps in the door. I think that's a key advantage that we offer. You know, another one is that we are an organization that's centered around dealers. It is the large majority of our account production, um, and so you, know, you can know that you are a you know key priority of the company, um, and that. That, you know, Niles and I are out there talking to our dealers every single day, multiple times a day. And I think the third thing is that we, we are building these relationships with our dealers in a way that is flexible to their needs. And that, you know, we're trying to, uh, to build a long-term relationship where we both win, right? We have, you know, we have uh, deepened and increased the revenue share that our dealers uh, get over the life of the customer um, because we want them to, to profit from customers for life, just like we do. Um, we've also, uh, you know, worked with them to, to give them this revenue share because it gives their businesses more reliable cash flow. It gives their businesses more value if they want to sell that business one day. Um, we, we want our dealers to stay with us for the long term, and we want them to make we want them to make a lot of money in doing it, um, and we want to do that in a way where it's also great for the customer. So, the, one of the biggest things that that I've focused on in my you know, short time here, when we I talked at the outset about trust and their being partners and what and what that really means, 
um, is as a first matter, aligning our financial incentives so that we want long-term customers, they want long-term customers, right? We both make money from long-term customers. Um, and then building a relationship with them where um, they feel like we have their back. Um, you know, I, I came to Brinks after eight years in the military. Um, and one of the most powerful things that the, the armed forces have is the feeling that you and your, whether it's sailors or and shipmates or if you're soldiers, whatever the word is, if you're in the Air Force, Navy, Marines, or um, the Army, like you feel like the people that you're there with have your back. And when you have trust, when you when you rely on the financial incentives, and when you feel like you're all on the same team, um, you can just you can do such great things for the mission. And the mission here is the customer. We want to hold um, we want to hold customers for life. And so uh, I think it's a, it's been a big change for the business uh, to look at our dealers that way, to be flexible to their needs, to give them this, a source of long-term wealth, uh, to share the upside of the customer staying for years and years. Um, but it, I, it really resonated with our dealers. And, and what I'd say is we're, we're just getting started. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, 2021 is off to a great start. Um, I don't think we've recruited you know, this many dealers in the last month. I mean, I, I, it's been years. Um, and so it's, you know, it, what, what we're doing is working. Uh, we, you know, you may have seen we re-signed um, Skyline, which is our largest dealer, to a five-year contract. We've re-signed other dealers as well. Um, you know, our dealers, you know, not only getting new ones, but our, our big dealers are committing are committing to us. They're, you know, putting their money where their mouth is. And so it's, uh, it, it's, been, it's been fantastic. What about in terms of, uh, Crystal, you were down for this too, in terms of uh, community activism and giving back and, and doing that. Uh, I know the company does a lot of it. Um, why and, wh and what do you think the value is uh, internally and externally? Uh, there's incredible value on both sides for sure. Um, we've always had at our core um, a philanthropic Side. It's something that um, our team actually rallies around and a lot of our folks, including myself, are very active in our, um, in our civic sector. Uh, so it's, it's really actually something this year that we're continuing to build upon. We've had a number of small initiatives. Um, I know, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Mission 500 that we've done in the past, um, but we're actually uh, taking philanthropy in a new direction and really thinking about it as how can we continue to build on this area and really make it something that could drive consumer choice, but also be something that our, uh, our employees and our partners could really rally around. Um, so we're early stages, kind of thinking about what that could look like, um, but we do expect that we'll have uh, kind of a, a bigger impact, more meaningful thread um, and strategy that will go throughout the organization um, potentially this year. Very good. Thank you.